So I'm Don Ingber. I'm the founding director of the Wies Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. I'm also a professor in the medical school at Harvard and the engineering school. Also at Children's Hospital Boston as well. The, the current major challenge in the, in the medical world is that the drug development model is broken. Uh, it, it costs millions of dollars a year, double single compound. It has to go through extensive animal testing. But then the real problem is that the results often do not predict what happens in humans. And so somebody has to find a way out of this. The, the pharmaceutical companies blame the regulatory agencies. The regulatory agency says there's nothing better. So everybody's been searching for ways to, get, to have a model system where you could do it in vitro outside of the body that would actually more faithfully recapitulate the, the response that you see in the human body. And so we, we took an approach uh, that we call human organs on chips, where we use microchip manufacturing to develop small devices lined by living human cells that, that mimic organ level structure and function. You might say, why microchip manufacturing? And, and the reason is that those techniques give you control over feature scales at the same nanometer to micrometer size scale that living cells and tissues live at. So what our devices look like are they're the size of a computer memory stick. They're optically clear. They're made out of a silicon rubber that's flexible. And the best way to envision is we, make, we use microchip manufacturing to make very hollow channels that are tiny on the order of less than a millimeter in diameter. And so imagine you're driving a car through the, a tunnel and but it's only a mil less than a millimeter wide. And we cut it across horizontally with a very thin membrane of the same clear, flexible material that we engineer holes and pores so we can let things go back and forth. We coat it with molecules that are called extracellular matrix that are what hold cells together in tissues. You could think of like an egg carton on which cells sit. And to make, for example, a lung on a chip, we started by trying to model the air sac of the lung. This is where gas exchange occurs, airborne particulates that, you know, in smog, uh, aerosol buys drugs, delivery goes through this, this structure, pneumonias, metastasis, it all happens in the air sac. Air sac is a simple structure. It basically has air, a single layer of cells that line the air sac, an extracellular matrix that holds them together, and on the other side are the capillary blood vessel cells and then flowing blood. So we use the microchip manufacturing to make a hollow channel, a membrane. We put human cells from the air sac on top. We put air. We, put, we culture human cells from the lung, capillary blood vessels, on the bottom side of the same membrane, and then we flow medium. And then the trick is that because it's flexible, we can have side channels where we have cyclic suction and it stretches the membrane and the attached cells and you, to the same degree and the same rhythm as when we breathe in and out. And by recapitulating the physical microenvironment, the breathing motions, the flow, the air-cell interface, we actually get functionality that you never see in cells on a dish. So the, the problem is that there are certain toxicities that only express in human because, for example, there was, there was a drug, a cancer drug, that went through all animal testing and it, they didn't see any toxicity because the toxicity is dependent on a specific molecule in the kidney of a human that clears the drug, it pumps the drug out, and you, you wouldn't see it other, in, in, in an animal model. So you had to have human cells. So the, the idea really is to deal with the human cells and tissues, but not just dealing with the cells, deal with the organ level structure and function so that you can actually see complex effects of drugs or model disease processing. Right, so, so for example, in the lung on a chip, uh, we made a disease model of fluid on the lungs, people, it's called pulmonary edema. And we took a, there's a known drug, a cancer drug that's used, but it's dose limiting toxicity is that fluid goes out of the blood vessel into the airspace and people get shortness of breath and then it can cause death. And so, we, we took the same drug, we gave it intravenously, which in our case means injecting it into the vascular channel, and we saw fluid shifts into the airspace of this microengineered chip at the same time course and, and with the same dose that we see in humans. So we could actually recapitulate this disease, fluid on the lungs. More importantly, we found we only saw that with physiological breathing motions. 
So, so you had to have the physical environment. If you just had the cells and the layers, you wouldn't see this. We did the same thing looking at the toxicity, the injury induced by airborne particulates that mimic smog. Some people get allergies and get, you know, response to get injury in the lung. We see injury in our lung and a chip, but only with breathing motions. And we also see the breathing motions increase the absorption of the particles into the blood, 10, eight to 10 times higher than without breathing motions. And then we did animal model testing and we confirmed exactly the same thing. So this little rubber chip actually led to predictions about how physiology works. And then we could confirm it in, in vivo in the animal. So it, it, this really is more than just mimicking. It actually can give you new insights. Uh, we're now exploring testing viruses that things like uh, influenza, SARS, MERS, that you know are, are incredibly dangerous and communicable. They're no good animal models. And whether we could use these human chips to test that norovirus is a good example where the virus, you can't culture it in a dish to study it but we're going to try to explore whether we could keep it alive in our gut on a chip. We, we created a gut on a chip by taking a lung device, making it a little bit higher, wider, and we put intestinal cells, human intestinal cells. And these cells have been used for years by drug companies, but they're always thought to be very, they don't mimic human intestine very well. They, they, they just grow as a flat layer. But when we put them in our device and we give it, now we give it trickling-like flow, like the gurgling of your intestine, and we give it peristaltic-like cyclic deformations at the same rate as in your intestine. Now the cells spontaneously form villi, like uh, finger-like protrusions that increase the surface area for absorption, and they put out mucus. And now we get functionality such that we can grow microbiome, which are the normal healthy microbes that live in our gut. We could look at effects of probiotics, for example, and we could see effects of probiotics increasing the barrier function of the gut. Um, we could do pathogens and look at infections or inflammatory bowel disease. We could also add immune cells. We've done this in the lung and the gut, and you could see the, the inflammatory response uh, in real time, high resolution. So you, have a, you literally have a window into organ level structure and function with molecular scale resolution, which is Pharmaceutical companies just don't screen chemicals to find drugs. They have to understand mechanism, both of it, efficacy and toxicity, and this allows you to do that. So it's very interesting because in my talk, I show the Moore's Law Curve, yes. which is this exponential growth in computer power density oh, since 1970, right, doubling every year. However, there's actually a publication where they describe e -Rooms Law, which is Moore's Law backwards, which is basically that the number of medicines that have been improved has halved every year since 1950, even though funding has gone up dramatically. And, and part of that is just the huge expense of, of drug development and the, the use of bad models, both culture, cell cultures and animal models that don't predict results in clinical trials and cause failure. So, so it's been interesting with all the investment, it hasn't scaled like Moore's Law in the IT world. It's been the opposite. And so that's why people are searching for new alternatives. Well, they're starting to fund research for, one example is uh, Congress in America gave money explicitly to FDA to develop <clears throat> new ways to develop countermeasure drugs against threat agents like radiation toxicity, bio, bio threats, and chemical threats. Um, and so that because they have to stockpile countermeasure drugs and they just aren't there. It's unethical to expose humans in a clinical trial to you know Fukushima-like lethal radiation levels. So there's really not great ways to test it. Animal models aren't great. So we actually have a grant from the FDA uh, that is is basically we're taking our gut on a chip and our bone marrow on a chip, which we've created recently, and we're exposing it to radiation. And in controls, we expose whole animals and we show that they mimic very closely to what you see in animals. But, they, but if you put them on a dish, they don't look anything like it. Well, the hope is that you will, you will cut down the time. In the beginning, it's gonna be you know, internal research programs of pharmaceutical companies, cosmetics companies, chemical companies. But I hope over time, you'll be replacing one animal model at a time. But I think in, in the end, it should speed up the process, but more importantly, it should increase the likelihood of success.
that's really what, what we're all shooting for. The, the only way to have impact on the world is to commercialize things. Academics don't do that. And so we're in the process of trying to commercialize the organs on chips based on the development of automated instruments that we've been working on. So we've, we're developing instruments that you could, you, know, you could think of like a DVD player where each DVD has an organ and you could have 10 lungs or you could have lung, liver, kidney, and then they, they would link the fluidic channels so that you could watch how a drug is. You could put a, uh, an oral drug into the gut on a chip, watch it be absorbed, move to the liver, see it broken down, move to the kidney, see it peed out, and then see if you have heart toxicity or whether it you know affects how your liver functions. Um, and, and, and then you could do computational modeling to maybe predict what pharmaceutical companies do in animal studies all the time, which is called pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, how the drug is cleared and distributed in the body. And this helps you define dosing and regimen, which is very important for establishing clinical trials. So um, we're hoping to commercialize this because we've got some good preliminary results with this automated instrument that suggests it is really feasible. They start simple, but over time add complexity. And the only way that this is going to have impact is if pharmaceutical companies and big companies can buy something that without knowing how to be an engineer, they could use. And, that, and so, so we're hoping to commercialize that. I, we hope that there'll be instruments that could be sold in three years, two to three years. Now, that's not going to change things overnight, but it, it is to begin to integrate it and see if you can replace animal testing. And, and we think it'll be progressive, like one animal model at a time. Our pulmonary edema paper was very promising. If people are using a, a pulmonary edema animal model, and we could show we can get the same sort of result, and then we could show we could get the same robustness, the statistical significance, the replicas, then I think the FDA type regulatory agency would begin to accept it in lieu of, of that animal model. And that would be one model, and then to the next, and the next. Um, FDA is very interested in having it for their own tox. They have to do testing themselves and have some ways to measure toxicity. I, I, I think there are things also that are exciting that you can do on chips you can't do otherwise. Radiation is one example, but for example, it's very hard to do clinical trials on children ethically and, and just, you know, they don't want to take the risk. But we could take cells from children and put them on chips. Um, I think the, in the long run, what's going to speed up drug development and decrease costs is. Right now, pharmaceutical companies will often, you know, they have to make a huge investment. It takes 15 years, a half a billion dollars, and then often they fail. And then what they do is they get statisticians in and they number crunch and they look, maybe there was a subpopulation of people that have a different genotype that respond better, and sometimes they find it. And then they go back a few years later and they do a small clinical trial and then they get approved. So with the chips, we could actually get cells from specific genetic subgroups, you know, ethnic groups or disease groups, and try to design drugs for that population. And then you have your clinical trial group already selected effectively. And you don't have to spend money trying to do it for everybody. I think that can, that could actually speed up the, the whole drug development process and greatly save costs and time. And that's, you know, it's a vision right now, but it's, it's, it's feasible. My scientific career was, was really launched when I was an undergraduate student at Yale. I was a science student, but I always loved art. And I, was, and I saw art students walking around with little sculptures that looked a lot like the viruses that I was studying in my class. And I asked them, what, what's the name of the class? And they said, three-dimensional design. And, at, and I was working on molecular structure function, which is basically three-dimensional design, the shape of a molecule. It's function like the lock and key of an enzyme in a substrate. I got, I got into the course and um, the teacher one day had this sculpture that was made of sticks and strings. The sticks didn't touch, but they were suspended midair by being connected with the string. And, and it was in a round shape, and as he talked, he would flatten it on a table and he would let go and it would bounce off, off the table. And it was called tensegrity, tensional integrity, it comes from Buckminster Fuller and uh, sculptor Kenneth Nelson. It's the way our bodies are built, with muscles pulling our bones up against gravity and the tension in your muscles controls our stiffness. I could be stiff or flexible. That's tensegrity. But I saw this sculpture bounce up and down and I had just by chance 
that week learned how to culture cells in a cancer lab at Yale across the campus. And cells grow flat on a dish, and if you want to move them to a dish, you use an enzyme that clips their anchors, and they bounce up off the dish and round up just like that model. And I thought, oh, that's the way cells must be built. It was 1976, and the first papers were coming out that all cells, they're not balls of jelly or water balloons filled with molasses. They, they actually have an internal skeleton called a cell skeleton or cytoskeleton. And so I knew that they had these filaments, and I knew cells create tension, or muscle cells create tension. So I thought, oh, they must use tensegrity. And I went back to the, the uh, cancer lab, and uh, the guy I was working with, we were testing a drug, and it caused the cell to change shape. And I said, oh, the tensegrity must have changed. He said, what's tensegrity? I said, oh, Buckminster Fuller, art class, sculpture. He said, never say that again. And so, and then shut up, and I basically went to libraries and read about it. And I began to realize that there's something here. It, that led me to think about physicality and the idea that mechanical forces may be as important as chemicals and genes for development. And that is really at the core of the whole organs on chips, because the real novel advance we made is not only to, to recapitulate the tissue-tissue interfaces that make an organ. organ, you know, organ so tissues are groups of cells. Organs are groups of tissues that have new functions. So, but it was also to have the physicality of the environment, because for 35 years I've shown that mechanical forces can actually regulate growth and function and, and, and death and development and disease processes. And you could literally stretch the cell and it will grow, and if you round the cell, it'll make it stop growing and do specialized function. And that, that led me to develop devices, these organs on chips, that have the right physical environment. And that's really been key to get the functions that we get that other people don't get. Because there are a lot of people working in the field, but, but our chips have so far been the most, most effective at, at mimicking really how the organ works. Um, one of the properties of tensegrity, that as you apply force on it, it gets stiffer and stiffer in direct proportion as you apply more stress. That turns out to be a fundamental property of cells, tissues, molecules, and that's because basically tensegrity is used at all size scales in the hierarchy of life. And I, I called that the architecture of life in my Scientific American in 98. Um, and we've been, and recently people are confirming molecules are built this way. I confirm cells are built this way, our body's built this way. It turns out tissues are built this way. So it actually is a fundamental design principle. And it's something that at the Wies Institute we actually use not only in, um, in terms of forces and organs on chips, but people who are developing artificial robots that fly are using tensegrity designs to make very light skeletons. We've used, we've made molecular tensegrities that have shape stability based on the system at the nanometer scale. Um, so it, it's, it's a principle that it's very broad and it, it, it applies to all facets of biology and living systems. Well, you know, as director of the Wies Institute, I have the incredible vantage point in seeing the best, the brightest, and, you know, what's coming down the way. I get this, this, this vision of what's coming because I'm working with the leaders who are doing the work that is pushing the forefront. And so uh, come to the Wies Institute website and you will see the future.